The challenge constitutionalists presented here last week lay in the value and power of participation. Participation at whatever level is appropriate for anyone intending or wanting to be persuaded to vote at the next election, and thus to help in pioneering a participative democracy. As last week, lessons from the French Revolution were carefully considered, so this week I quote from Paul Nicholson of Tottenham as he examines lessons learnt from aspects of poverty in local English history. He is reviewing the new book of one already participating in the 2015 Constitutionalist Initiative, Fred Harrison. His book, entitled As Evil Does, Handbook on Humanity, One Anatomy of a Killing Culture. It reaches to the depths of why most of us act with caring palliatives in the extant system without also creating the willingness to develop a curative and systemic way of changing major structural faults in both our politics and our economy. Paul Nicholson writes, The chapter called The Killing Cult should be read, marked and learnt by every MP, peer and bishop. While the government was planning to airbrush the Child Poverty Act 2010 into the Life Chances Act 2010, Fred Harrison was prov proving that Britain is founded on a set of laws and financial policies that predetermine the life chances of a new generation and then that poverty is treated as a pathology largely attributable to the failing of the individual. It is, in fact, a pathology embedded in a population by a culture that breeds po poverty as a by-product. The killing begins with the cells that constitute the limbic brain of newborn babies. That is the part of the brain that regulates emotions like love. Paul quotes Professor Michael Crawford, who researches the dangers of poor maternal nutrition, stating that low birth rate associated with fetal growth restriction is the strongest predictor of poor learning ability, school performance, behavioral disorders, and crime. The set of laws and policies that predetermine such poor life chances started among the robber barons of the Magna Carta in 1215. In 1330, Henry de Birch, then Bishop of Lincoln and second son of a baron, was given the freehold of his manor of Finkst and licensed to enclose his wood with the adjoining 300 acres of land. This is one of the six parishes in the Hambledon Valley near Hemley-on-Thames, where Paul was a vicar from 1982 to 1999. This encroachment on the common lands of the people was the cause of much complaint and hunger. Such land grabs then began a headlong rush in the 17th century when peasants were turned into vagabonds. And that left, and that theft from the people continued at an ever increasing pace to the present day. There is no sign of it being changed until the bust of all busts brings politicians to their senses. That is inevitable, he says, and not long arriving. Before Magna Carta, the king was supposed to be responsible for the welfare of all his people. They worked for their sustenance on the common land. Fred Harrison shows that in the Magna Carta, the main burden of government expenses was shifted from land to personal property, hence to the whole population, without any regard to their holding of land. The barons grabbed the land and made the people pay taxes. That, he claims, was the beginning of the tragic condition of Britain today. Powerful people become rent-seekers buying land which exists for the public good of everyone, but privatizing the income and the capital gain. Regrettably, 
the churches are still active participants in this injustice. Hong Kong is an example of a fairer way to fund those services common to all people. The costs of the administration were found from the rents that merchants were happy to pay to locate their business on, on that prosperous island. So taxes were low and the people of Hong Kong had more to spend in their pockets. Denmark introduced the land tax in the early 20th century and is now the number one happiest nation on earth. Taiwan introduced an urban land value tax in 1954 and became the first Asian tiger. As a Liberal Member of Parliament, Winston Churchill, with Lloyd George, campaigned to reform the tax system. He wanted new charges on the rents that flowed into the pockets of landowners. But the landlords prevented the people of Britain reclaiming their ancient rights in the courts and in the House of Lords. The powerful land grabbers won again. Harrison describes how a culture of cheating evolved the capacity to shroud in mystery the social nature of rent linked to land and how its privatization damages our lives. In Tottenham, where Paul lives now, the rentiers are in a majority of 58% of householders over the owners on 42% according to the 2011 census. Renters are 33% of households nationally and 47% in London. National policy from all the major parties panders to the majority with rising equity in their homes as landowners, thus leading renters to the whim of landlords and international speculators in the UK free market in land and housing, or by attempting to bribe renters into owning. The robin, robber barons are now the wealthy from Greece, Spain, Italy and China fleeing their own dodgy economies. National and international speculators buy land and leave it empty. Successful builders hoard land waiting for the price to rise. Housing benefit payments to landlords by the taxpayer rise with the market to 24 billion and the tenant's housing benefit is capped. The tenants also pay direct and indirect taxes. National benefits are taxed by 250 councils in England and Wales. Tenants gain nothing from the increase in the value of the land. That is the injustice at the heart of the current housing deal. Paul sums up. There is no need to privatise the land, just replace the inefficient taxes, such as council tax, business rates and stamp duty, with a low tax on all land, the common heritage of every citizen, and of course lower income tax and that. In conclusion, I return our minds to participative democracy, a way we can all contribute to, a cha to changing the cruel culture of cheating and killing to a culture-changing movement, trustees all. This movement can set us on the path to a confederation of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland if it is built on your involvement in preparing to make votes count in a new and just people's political economy of trusteeship in harmony with nature. Thank you.